Hi everyone, uh, just before we get into this video, just a quick sh uh, advert really uh, to promote our Kickstarter that Chipotle Publishing are running at the moment on the reprint of The Grand Old Lady in No Man's Land. It's being reprinted as the, pride of, uh, the Vickers Machine Gun, The Pride of the Emma Gs. And that's a project that I was lucky enough to help Dolph Goldsmith with uh, by contributing some material to alongside Dan Shea and Robert Siegel. So please go to the Kickstarter link in the description and you know, click on that and go and support that project. We really want to get it off the ground. It's nearly there as of uh, as of today, 25th of June. There's not that much further to go, but there are enhancements if we do get it to further targets. So please do. And while you're there, uh, you know, two more quick adverts. T-shirts, if you like the T-shirts that I'm wearing in the videos, then go to our Teespring uh, store. So there's a link in the... Uh, link in the description for that as well and if you like what we're doing please do go and support us on patreon sign up to give a small monthly amount and that really supports the videos but it also gets you a lot of access to different archive material that we don't generally share on the website so thank you for your support so far by getting this far i hope you enjoy the video uh, and you know like share subscribe give us your comments let us know thank you very much hi there welcome to another video from the vickers mg collection and research association uh, as always, hopefully you're all subscribed to the channel. Uh, if you're not, please do so. It really helps su support us and show that you're there watching these videos as well. Um, and, and this video is sort of following on from the uh, Operation Overlord video, where we look a little bit more at how the Vickers was being used in practice, not just the technical aspects. So in this video that I'm releasing on the 25th of June, 2020, the 70th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War, uh, We'll talk about just that, how the Vickers medium machine gun was being used during the Korean War. Uh, I'm aware that the British didn't get involved for, for a fair few weeks yet, uh, you know, from this anniversary. But you know, hopefully uh, th there's some noise around the anniversary today, 25th of June. And, and this, this video is obviously going to be available throughout anything that happens. Um, the, the Vickers was in use of the British, the British. Uh, the Australian and the Canadian forces that were taking part in the uh, in the Korean War, and you know, as such, it, it's one of those sort of, you know last almost combat uses of the Vickers in a conventional sense. Um, it wasn't really uh, used; you know, didn't have an opportunity to be used conventionally uh, after after that period. Um, as were many of the, of the sort of British uh, and Commonwealth infantry infantry tactics. So I want to talk really about um, the, the intent of how the Vickers was being used and then some of the practice. And, and we've been through, thanks to, to John Prince, who's a member of the association, he's been through his collection of unit histories around the Korean War. And I've been through some of, some of the information that I've sourced from the National Archives or through my own writing. Um, and, and obviously some of, the, some of the manuals as well just to try and understand you know, how, the application of the medium machine gun capability during that period. Uh, the gun remains exactly the same as we'd seen it through the Second World War. The equipment we've got available is the, you know, the, the standard Mark I medium machine gun on its Mark IV mounting with the dial sight for that indirect fire uh, out to 4,500 yards if needed. Uh, the ammunition belts and these stripless ammunition belts with factory filled ammunition. So, you know, the gun is largely the same. Uh, the, the equipment, though, ha has moved on a little bit, the personal equipment of, of the machine gunner. Um, uh, and this sort of half mannequin that we've got here represents how the 29th Brigade uh, were using what equipment they were wearing during the winter months in Korea. And, it, and it's important that actually much of the other... Uh, sort of uh, climate or, or much of the other sort of weather that happened in Korea, those other seasons, can be directly translated to, to many other areas around the world and particularly in the Far East. Uh, so we'll cover that in, in, in other videos. But the winter climate in Korea meant that you know, a water-cooled Vickers machine gun had to have some, some sort of special thought around that. Uh, and so I'll talk about that sort of technical aspect in a moment. But first, you know, the equipment. The, the, the soldiers were wearing these, these windproof smocks, a, a British made printed windproof smock, uh, you know, suited for uh, cold weather climates, you know, white gloves, uh, over gloves in this case, 
um, you know, over, over woolen mittens uh, to provide some waterproofing to stop that those woolen mittens soaking all the way through. They do actually have um, a, a thumb, but not a, a trigger finger. So you'd have to take those off to fire the, to fire the gun, but they were wear, wearing those as well. But then the, the ironic piece is the 1944 pattern web equipment, because that's actually designed for jungle warfare. So it's a lightweight cotton weave, different to the 37 pattern equipment. Uh, but the, you know, so, so the 29th Brigade wore, wore that equipment. The 27th Brigade, uh, the other British troops uh, that arrived uh, later on, were actually wearing 37 pattern equipment. Uh, so the standard 1937 pattern equipment that you see. Uh, and uh, they were in so, uh, so, some more, um, because of the time of year, they, they were wearing uh, their battle dress and, you know, the, 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 the equipment that, changes over time and this video can't be about that we'd spend so much time looking at the evolution of winter warfare gear or the different equipment that was being used um so we just picked a representative you know atypical um you know image uh that we've seen in photographs um and i'll pop one up now of how the you know the windproof smock with the 44 pattern equipment was being used and one of the key elements that we'll we'll get from the accounts is the use of the general service pack board as well that the, the um you know for man carrying items you know this can carry several uh probably no more than four in reality uh liners it can also be used to carry the tripods and the guns as well uh but the, you know this this is in that photo and you know these were being used to carry a lot of the equipment as well and you know as we get through some of the accounts you'll see that the you know, there was extensive use of porters um, because, of, because of the terrain that, uh, that you know, Korea presented. So, you know, say, personal equipment, quite different to how you know, we're seeing Second World War usage. The Vickers, technically exactly the same, but the, uh, the organisation uh, is, is what changes massively. Um, or or changes after the Second World War massively, and Korea is the first application of that. Uh, I mentioned the cold weather, and one of the accounts that, that we have available uh, you know, goes into a little bit more detail about you know, the, the antifreeze um, mixtures that were being used, and the fact that weapons were being used really dry. You know, they were not oiled, because the oil was freezing. Um, you know, in the, in, in the extreme cold temperatures, the oil of the gun was freezing, so they were being kept as dry as possible. They were using almost a quarter antifreeze in these. Now, uh, trials on freezing water jackets and things were going all the way back to the early 1900s uh, with the lessons learned from the Russo-Japanese War you know, in, in the same part of the world uh, of, the, of the water called Maxims. Uh, that were freezing up there. So the British Army was well aware of the problems that were, were being faced, and it doesn't seem to have had any particular, um, caused any particular problem, but it was, a, it was a, a potential problem that had to be avoided. So they were you know, putting a very, very strong antifreeze mix in these uh, and keeping them barely oiled, um, if at all, to make sure that those, uh, those pieces didn't freeze. Um, and clearly when you're having, you know, there's a lot of metal, uh, to, to freeze against if the temperatures are that low. So importance of the water jacket pads. Um, we've seen a photograph, uh, not one I, I think I can share, maybe, maybe I can, I'll, I'll have to check. Uh, if I can, it'll be on the screen now, um, of a Browning M1917A1 being used with British forces, uh, Royal Marine Commandos in Korea, because uh, one of those units, 41 Commando, was largely American, uh, US equipped, uh, including weapons and everything. Uh, but it does seem that they were using a British Vickers machine gun water jacket pad uh, to deal with one of those problems of you know freezing uh, freezing hands against um, or uh, against the water jacket itself. So yeah, some some real problems um, you know, being faced with the climate that Korea presented. Uh, so ironically, as I'm sat here, uh, you know, talking about cold weather equipment, it's one of the warmest days of the year. So uh, you know. I'm sweating profusely, haven't put all, all this stuff into place, um, but you know, so be it. Anniver anniversaries fall when anniversaries fall, don't they? Um, we can't do anything about that. So I'm going to go through some of these uh, accounts that we've got out of the unit histories mainly. 
and it's worth just seeing the contrast of how the the medium machine guns were being used and you know, one of the things that i note from from the research that i did for the history of the small arms school corps is that the the small arms school at netheraven the machine gun wing had been disbanded in in 1947 um, well, the, it appears that the, the, the whole sort of uh, inf small arms school at Netheraven was. And the site was taken over by um, another organisation, the Visual Inter-Services Training and Research Establishment, Vistry, as it was uh, just referred to, camouflaging and uh, deceiving. Uh, and the, the, sort of the mortar wing and things moved away from Netheraven. But in uh, January 1949, the... The machine gun wing was was set up again or the machine gun division of the infantry heavy weapons wing was set up and almost just in time so one of the last units to go through that was the gloucestershire regiment and a, a guy called bert bidmead uh, wrote in the small arms school corps journal so he, he was an instructor at netheraven he wrote in the journal how they actually wrote back from korea and said look we we don't know how to do map predictive fire uh, we don't know how to do some of the indirect fire things because we weren't taught that. So some things were, were dropping off because originally the Vickers had been intended for uh, obsolescence in the nineteen in the late 1940s and the divisional machine gun battalions had disappeared. So the organisational piece that we'll, we'll touch on in a moment um, were, means that some of the corporate knowledge from the Second World War, corporate memory as, as we term it now, had been lost and all those skills of the indirect uh, fire capabilities, barrage fire, weren't even being taught. And when you haven't got a central small arms school at Netheraven disseminating those, high, the, those lessons either, um, it becomes really difficult. So some of that is lost. But one of the, uh, one of the accounts that we've got is of the Duke of Wellington's regiment. And uh, so it's Fortune Favours the Brave, The Battle of the Hook by A.J. Barker, um, published by Pen and Sword. And th this talks about uh, a Captain Sam Robertson, who was the platoon commander for the medium machine gun platoon. And he was clearly interested in the Vickers. Uh, he was dedicated, it says he's dedicated. Uh, and one of the other terms used, is, I think, is beloved, uh, is beloved Vickers guns. So he was teaching the men the intricacies of indirect and barrage machine gun concentration, but recognise it needs patience. Uh, it's you know, a lot of effort and, and endurance as well. So he, he tries to form this the machine, machine gun platoon, um, which, is, which is what the infantry battalions now have, of six guns. Uh, and also in the 1951 manual, the org chart that I'll, I'll share, uh, the organogram, actually shows that there were three sections of two machine guns each, and then a section of wasps. Now, wasp is a universal carrier-borne flamethrower. Uh, but what the... the the um the that particular account says was that the wasp section that formed part of the machine gun platoon during the later stage of the second world war had been abolished in korea there was a there was little use for a flame throwing vehicle so you know, then they're not using all of the capability what it does say is that the organization of the machine gun platoon was a platoon headquarters and three medium machine gun sections all carried in quarter ton trucks so they had three quarter ton uh, yeah, quarter ton, not three quarter ton, quarter ton trucks uh, per section. Now that could be a Jeep, uh, could be uh, a Land Rover, Series one. It's not really clear what, what vehicle they're using there. And in the manuals, they actually say that it, it should be a universal carrier. Um, but although we see some universal carriers in Korea, uh, some equipped with medium machine guns, they're not uh, sort of widespread. Uh, and certainly some of the accounts don't mention them at all. Uh, but there are photos of MMG equipped carriers in place. So Why were the Duke of Wellington Regiment uh, using their, their, their guns, their Vickers? So the, the, the account says that in Korea, the DWR's MGs were used mainly for map shooting, indirect fire at night. Some 50 pre-recorded defensive fire DF MG machine gun tasks were included in the hook defensive fire plan. The Vickers guns use the same techniques as the artillery to fire on map reference targets, but with even greater problems of safety and crest clearance. During the Third Battle of the Hook, pre-recorded map reference targets were supplemented by requests for non-recorded map reference shoots, which were worked out from scratch. So that sets out really that it's being used to its fullest capability. The indirect fire shoots using the dial sight, 
uh, you know, uh, targets that you can't see. Something that the medium machine gun excels at, and it's really the peak of all of that training that Robertson had put the platoon through. Uh, that's in contrast, though, to some of the other accounts. And it might not be this one. Uh, certainly, I, I can't recall exactly which is which. Uh, the one I'm looking now at now is The Edge of the Sword by Anthony Farrah Hockley of the Gloucestershire Regiment, yeah, famed for, for fighting at the Imjin. And yeah, th th this talks about yeah, very much sort of the classic uh, view of machine gunnery fire. So direct fire, targets you can see. Uh, you know, and now, to the defender's aid, the carefully planned defensive fire is summoned. So it's some plan, you know, within that, but it, it, it sounds like um, not necessarily uh, indirect. The vicar's guns cut across the cliffs and slopes by which the Chinese forces climb to the attack. Long bursts of fire, 10, 20, 30, 40 rounds are fired and fired again. The water in the cooling jacket warms, the ground is littered with spent cases. The mortars and the gunners drop their high explosive in amongst the crowded ranks that press on to the, to the hill slopes from the river crossings. So, you know, start, boils up after a thousand rounds, probably mentioned that before. Uh, so they're certainly going to get through some, uh, some, some ammunition in these kind of, these kind of actions. Um, you know, and it talks about how uh, you know, it was going to be touch and go. Whilst a mixed party of mortarmen, signalers, police and drivers were assembled to make a sortie to their aid. So uh, B Company uh, of the Gloucesters being cut off. Uh, Sa Sam got one of Sergeant Hopers Vickers across. They began to fire down into the re-entrant. With relief, we saw that the pursuit had stopped. Uh, Henry was still distributing grenades to the relief party when I joined him. It's all right, I said. The Vickers has fixed them. Dennis's party will be up here in 10 minutes. So you're clearly using the guns quite mo mobile uh, it, it, to, to get into relief as, as well. Um, then we've got the Imjin and Kapyong battles, Korea 1951 by Mackenzie. Uh, so uh, uh, sort of uh, different uh, academic book. Um, This is this slightly this is interesting. So, uh, yet yeah, while it's worth noting that both encounters spurred on the collective, an individual search for greater firepower. So obviously referring to one of the battles, the number of medium machine guns allocated to each battalion in Twenty Eighth Brigade, for instance, was officially raised in the summer of nineteen fifty one from six to nine, while the unofficial hunt for American personal weapons continued. So this is this is quite interesting. That they're actually looking at increasing. Um, I can't quite work out whether they're going to inc increase the number of sections or the number of uh, guns per section. Possibly three guns per section, as opposed to just the two. Uh, there, there's a reference to an imperial uh, to a um, national archives file that I can't access at the moment. So, so we'll have to uh, have to look to see whether that was at, so whether the question was asked and answered in the affirmative. Um, so, yeah, part, partly reason, reason for this is, though, apart from its poundage when carried, the only trouble with the Vickers, i.e. it was heavy, uh, was that in view of the vast number of Chinese infantry in Korea, the number allotted, three two-gun sections in each battalion, organised as a medium machine gun platoon, proved to be on the low side. So, yeah, this, this is um, talking about, then, then it talks about the, the number of Brens and how they're trying to increase those as well. So they're just looking for more automatic firepower to deal with these, uh, to deal with the, the, the Chinese attacks in the numbers that they were coming in on. Uh, then we've got some, some great um, uh, mythology that exists around the Vickers being dealt with. Uh, and it's talking about the water available. The shortage of water was such that little could be spared to replace what had been used up in the cooling water jackets of the Vickers machine guns, necessitating a not terribly successful attempt to use urine as an emergency substitute coolant. Nevertheless, the, the 400-odd still unwounded Gloucesters could now hold on again, at least for the time being. So that exists in First World War accounts as well. And I said mythology because you know, it obviously happened but it was few and far between, it seems. And it seems that almost every account of it happening has reached the history books because it's one of those great accounts that you can start to share, isn't it? Um, what have we got here for, from, the same, from the same book? Um, not really clear. 
so oh yeah uh, so um we've got some some of the attacks still happening at considerable risk sergeant george harris and two privates ran down and grabbed what they could, only to discover that though 303 in calibre, what they had recovered in belts was meant for Vickers guns and was liable to jam in the breaches of Lee Enfields and Bren guns. Now that, I think, is a little bit wrong. Um, yeah, you can strip the 303 rounds out of the belts. It's not going to jam in the breaches. What it might be is Mark 8Z ammunition rather than Mark 7. So it will burn out barrels quicker. Um, it will burn hotter, so maybe over, you know, after a number of rounds um, fired, it will jam. So maybe that's what they're meaning. But obviously talk about getting extra ammunition up uh, uh, forward there. So yeah, we, we, we've then come on to uh, Andrew Salmon's book, To the Last Round, also Imjin. And you know, a, a great photo there where we can see almost exactly this equipment. Cap comforter, um, the, the windproof smock, and the you know, pack um the the man pack there pack board um all being used in the same photo so it's so a great example of of what we've got on display here um and what we're saying is the company's in direct support of the company uh, sorry the vickers is in direct support of the company so now what what more in his platoon could see flashes advancing up a company's hill behind him a pair of vickers were firing in support what more thought the long, slow arcs of their fire beautiful in the night sky, the bright traces floating around lazily through the darkness. Uh, his aesthetic delight was interrupted when the machine gun position began to attract return fire. You know, if you're using tracer, um, yes, it starts to ignite a, a few hundred yards out, but if it's all coming from one area, the Vickers will eventually give itself away. Uh, so behind what more D Company commander Captain Mike Harvey was pleased at the 200 yard killing zone the machine guns cut but was momentarily disturbed when he realised their effect carrying clearly through the night air came the screaming of the wounded Chinese so the Vickers were have very much having an impact on Imjin there um, yeah, another account uh, they scattered, so the Chinese scattered, there was a lull, then a Vickers section spotted an enemy O group, so an orders group a thousand yards away. Potts ordered the machine gunners to hold their fire until they had settled themselves down. Watching through field glasses as around 20 enemy were maps huddled for the briefing, he could barely believe his luck. Two Vickers fired long bursts. The Chinese were bowled over. Survivors dashed for cover. The wounded crawled. Through his binoculars, Potts counted eight bodies. So, uh, so what's that? You know, eight out of twenty, a significant success rate, uh, really. Uh, so forty percent casualties being caused by two Vickers firing long bursts. Probably only twenty-five round bursts, in all fairness, um, but much longer than what you'd experience with the Brens. Uh, another account that gives a, a you know again a different perspective. Uh, pluck under fire. So with the Middlesex Regiment, you know the Middlesex and the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers had been divisional machine gun battalions in the Second World War, or certainly some of their battalions had. Um, but no, very little of that corporate knowledge, as as I mentioned, remained. So this one by John Pluck, um, you know, talks about uh, ammo shortages again, ammunition shortages. Uh, it was getting dark, but our company commander had spotted that the MMG section had left behind two boxes of ammunition. He yelled at Lieutenant Plum, take care of that ammo. Lieutenant Plum then yelled at me, take care of that ammo, and went off down the track. I looked at the boxes with some dismay. I knew only too well how much the boxes weighed. Uh, it's £22 or 10 kilo. Uh, and it would take two men just to lift them off the ground. Not really sure about that. Maybe they were the uh, twin uh, two boxes in a H29 or a H50. So that's nearly £50 in those boxes. And those certainly do take... Uh, a, you can lift one, but you're not moving it very far. Negotiating those boxes down the track would take an hour at least, and it was almost dark. I was equally certain that Lieutenant Plum would not hold up the transport back to our base for the sake of nine of his men. I told four of my chaps to lift up the boxes by the carrying handles, and then I fussed around until Lieutenant Plum had disappeared. Me and my section were all alone with the ammo. I ordered the boxes to be thrown into the slit trench and then covered up with soil. This was done, and only then did we make our way down the track. Lieutenant Blum was waiting on the road and asked me about the boxes. I replied, we dealt with them. He looked at me with a puzzled expression, expression but made no further comment. So, a yeah, great example of how normal soldiers being used as porters or carrying the, vicar, carrying the machine gun kit did not want to be carrying that stuff. They... they, you know, they they um they, they stayed away from it if they could. Uh, now, looking at the Canadian experience, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry from Beyond the Danger Close. Uh, we're using two Vickers MGs, 
in company headquarters uh, this time in the so what we've got second battalion. Uh, they're lacing the enemy with fire. Ammunition's running low. Uh, the the Vickers machine guns are behind and above us, firing continuously over our heads. They are killing hundreds and hundreds of Chinese. They are charging in rows. Hundreds are lined up behind each other, incessantly blowing their bloody bugles. They are being killed off like flies. Where the hell do they keep coming from? How many more thousands do we have to kill just to survive? They charge at us in everlasting bloody fucking relays. So, you yeah, know, the Vickers is clearly coming in its to a nose, just decimating these line-on-line -line human charges, these attacks that take place. Uh, 11 platoon of Vickers machine gun is moved into position and soon opens fire on the Chinese moving along the valley floor. There are no traces in the ammunition, so they cannot define the point of impact and the Vickers is removed. That's an interesting point. So, so the belts don't normally come mixed. They're normally just ball ammunition. Uh, so you, you could be mixing in tracer uh, if you, if you pre-prepared the ammunition or you were loading it separately. But generally, it didn't come as mixed belts until much, much later. Uh, and then... Uh, they, they actually looked at, so the PPCLI look at recovering one of the Vickers that they'd lost uh, in, to April 25th. So April 25th, I presume 1951, uh, might be wrong on that. But they, they talk about, you know, this, this MMG lying unattended at 12 platoon deserted slit trenches. Uh, so they had to go and get it. And in doing so, you know, they, they want to liberate this captured MMG, um, you know, what are they going to, uh, how are they going to do that? They charge down and then they, you, it talks about, here we go. Barwish foolish, Barwise, one of the, one of the guys in the attack, foolishly jumped up, ascended the crest, went to the trench and found the superhuman strength to retrieve the entire MMG unimposed. So he's picked up the gun with a tripod, don't know what else, but he's picked up a hundred pounds, so 50 kilos and is bringing that back. Um, Barwise grabs the MMG to join the rest of us below the crest of the slope. We remain below the entire time and then move off with Barwise, who carried the MMG to the main body of 12 platoon, and we return to C Company. So that's, you know, that, that, that's you know, superhuman strength is the phrase used in the, in the account here, which I'd have to agree with. They are hard work to carry, uh, particularly, you know, I don't know, but I assume, you know, much, much harder if you're under fire. Um, so it, it, it's uh, quite, quite remarkable. It talks about it being a hollow victory uh, to recover it because no one actually ended up witnessing the presence of the Chinese. But, you know, hollow victory or not, it's still quite an impressive achievement. Uh, so, yeah, so that was at Capyong and, um, you know, clearly, clearly a great example that of, of this suit of the the prowess with which you, know, you needed to get these guns into action people were seeing how effective they were against the chinese hordes so you know they started to value them a lot more than perhaps uh indirect fire where you can't see the guns um and because they're in the infantry battalions perhaps there's a wider understanding of them you know I, i'm sort of a bit of supposition here but yeah certainly interesting to see how it's being used differently and then I think this is the last account I've got here. So a new battlefield, Royal Ulster Rifles in Korea, uh, 1950 to 51. So by uh, David Orr and David Truesdale, published by Hellion, who also published my small arms school corps history. Uh, so they've got two guns here. Um, and the, the, the two guns under the command of Corporal Doc Halliday poured streams of bullets into the now visible enemy on Howe. Uh, one of the one of the target names until they themselves came under attack from the northwest. The gunners quickly swiveled the guns around, and a bit of firefight developed until the two machine guns began to run low on ammunition. Eventually, they were forced to withdraw towards the battalion area, closely pursued by the Chinese. Halliday remained in the position with one of the crews, and both men kept off fire using their personal weapons. As the enemy closed in, hand grenades were thrown up to keep them off. Only when Halliday was sure that both Vickers guns and the patrol had made a safe return to friendly lines did he and the riflemen withdraw. This action earned Halliday the military medal for his coolness on the hilltop. Rifleman McShane received a mention in dispatches. So a you know, great example again of the Vickers being you know, central to the action. But then we get on to uh, an account of, of the cold weather that they were facing. All weapons were treated with a special lubricant, but many st still many firing pins snapped with the cold and they all froze. 
It proved mo more efficient to keep the weapons almost dry. The Vickers machine guns had their water jackets filled with antifreeze to ensure that they could be brought into action immediately. While for Bren the Bren guns, a solution was found that involved constructing a small fireplace in each trench under, under where the gun usually rested, keeping the Bren clear of ice and providing a little warmth for the men. So actually what I said earlier was wrong. Um, this account talks about it being filled with antifreeze rather than just a, a quarter solution. So yeah, quite remarkable. Uh, I talked about porters and the difficulty in moving the equipment around. The MMG platoon was cut to into a single section of two Vickers, while the mortar platoon was reduced to two sections, each of two mortars. Uh, this meant that the crews made redundant would be able to assist in carrying the weapons and ammunition. Given the terrain they had to be fought across, this was the only way of transporting the weapons. So it's quite, you know, they, they are man carrying these weapons in long carries, uh, you know, back, backwards and forwards around the, the, the whole area. You know, quite a remarkable feat. Um, so we've got some prearranged fire being discussed by the IUR as well. Uh, from a section of Vickers that were established on high ground. So it's quite, the fact that we've got just two guns, some, one of the basic principles in any of the training is that two guns should only be used on the direct fire task. Indirect fire task should always be four guns. So if you're reducing your whole section, your, your, your whole capability down to two guns, really by the book, you can only do um, you know, direct fire tasks. And I think that goes along with a lot of what they're in, encountering. They do it seem to be doing a lot of direct fire or indirect fire, um, quite simple indirect fire. So, you know, large areas, uh, swathes of beaten zones to deal with Chinese Chinese attacks. Um, it's what, yeah, so the so the uh, the citation for Corporal William McWilliam Halliday for gallantry, coolness, and complete disregard for his own safety. Corporal Halliday on the 25th of September 1951 was commanding a machine gun section that formed the firm base for an outpost platoon some 600 yards ahead. During the afternoon, the outpost and the machine gun position came under heavy mortar fire. The officer and the gunner OP of the outpost platoon were both killed and the remainder were compelled to withdraw by the enemy attack. Corporal Halliday, on seeing the platoon withdrawing, immediately gave covering fire and engaged the enemy at a range of about 500 yards. He carried on firing until both guns ran out of ammunition when he sent the guns back but remained with one other man and carried on the fire with small arms until the platoon had successfully withdrawn through his position. By his devotion to duty and gallantry, there is no doubt that this action enabled the platoon to withdraw without further loss. At one time, the enemy approached so close that he was compelled to throw grenades. So I'll stop reading from the accounts there. Um, and, and I hope they just give a, a really interesting picture of how the Vickers is being used in Korea. We've got some units uh, where they spent the time practicing indirect fire, clearly using it as part of their defensive fire plans. We've got other units just looking at you know, just two guns on their own. Everybody else is carrying stuff. But they're putting them forward and using them built into outpost positions as well. Possibly how we envisage the Vickers being used. Um, they've got problems with the cold weather. They've got problems with the terrain. The Vickers are having to be moved high up on hills to, to you know, not just sat in valleys. Otherwise, you get crest clearance problems and everything like that. Um, so... We've got them being moved not by their universal carriers... Uh, often not by their trucks that they're being used with as well. So it's really, I, I think that, that last account of, of that military medal citation uh, just sums up quite nicely how the Vickers was being used in, uh, in Korea. I was really privileged to meet a machine gunner of the Welsh Regiment who'd served in Korea a few years ago. He visited the collection and uh, he happened to live in the same village, uh, but uh, we didn't know um until until we sort of finally got in touch uh he happened to live in and he talked about the the cold weather problems he talked about not being able to dig in um because the ground was frozen so solid so they had to use you know logs to build emplacements for the machine guns as well and it was just great to to be able to speak to uh, to a veteran um of that campaign and you know and, and some of the others there, there was also uh, a chap um so that, that was a guy called Bob. Uh, there was also a chap, Ernie, who visited with him, uh, who was an Argyle in Sutherland Highlander. So he did, wasn't involved in the machine gun platoon, but uh, you know, 
valued the role that the Vickers played in career as well. And it is, I think, it's that last conventional period that machine guns are getting used. Uh, there's so much debate at that time about the role of the medium machine gun in the infantry battalion. It's up and down. Uh, but clearly, I, I, yeah, my view is that the action in Korea does set it apart and says, look, we were intending to declare this obsolescent. Uh, we don't have anything to replace it. Let's keep it in service. And it remains in service effectively for nearly another 20 years. 1968, when it's finally declared obsolete, it's being replaced by the general purpose machine gun, which has its sustained fire capability, the FN Mag, the L7, um, whatever flavor of name you want to call it, the general. Um, but the, the actions that the Vickers has in Korea clearly do uh, prove its worth for a much longer period in the British Army. And some of the records that are held by the National Archives that we've been able to see you know, do, do reflect some of that as well. It, but it was getting into a period of nuclear war. You know, the Cold War was all about posturing and deterrent. And the Vickers doesn't really provide a huge amount of deterrent against the mechanisation that was happening. Uh, it had been in service for 40 years by the time that the Korean War was happening, uh, but it, you know, it still had a role and it still proved its worth there. So I hope that's been interesting. Um, you know, and, and thank you very much for, 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 for listening to me talk about that. And I hope it's raised your awareness of not only the Vickers machine gun in Korea, but Korea in general. So thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like and share the video and subscribe to the channel. Please support us on Patreon if you're able to and let us know of anything you'd like to see in the future. I look forward to hearing from you.